And I'm just looking and I just cannot understand. We kill our people like that. We got to stand up, y'all. Come out. We're going to protest against the Penn Museum on Wednesday. And we're going to continue to expose the injustice in this system. Can I ask what the what your aim is for the protest on Wednesday? What do you, what do you hope to accomplish with that and going down to Penn Museum? Continue to expose. You want to expose this injustice? Look at look at Consuelo. You know this stuff is so horrible. It's so horrible that this system would do what they did to move, and then all these years later come back with this. And we know that they were not permitted to even do this. Our research and investigation showed that they were totally in the wrong for what they did. Totally in the wrong. And we're going to let the people know about it. Mm. I just got something to say. You know, because I don't think y'all really understand what you're looking at. Mm. When I lived down the street from Moon, I didn't like it. Like Moon, not because of anything I saw. I thought it was a little weird. My father used to call them my head and shit like that. And uh, but I saw these people every day scrubbing clothes and with my attitude at that time, you know, they back to nature. And uh, you know, I'm not interested in scrubbing no motherfucking clothes. That's how I felt. Then I'm seeing them running every day. I'm seeing healthy children going down the street singing. If you want to eat, get up and move your feet. They telling you to get on the move. They was an example for people. May 20th, 1977. Cops on one side with guns, move on the other side. What was proven not to be operable guns for a few hours. I learned on that day what move was about heard it for the first time. Nobody couldn't tell me. It was inside here. When they talked about the air that we have to breathe, people wasn't walking around with these tanks and shit at that particular point. John Africa told Moon that it ain't going to be long before you have to buy air. Are you buying air? Your mother's, your, the children is buying air. They talked about the water. I know for a fact there was Poland Spring. And I think it was about three different kinds of water then. And they was talking about how this government and you know, uh is playing games with us. You know, I'm talking about move is on this position, what's happening right here is because of move love for us, for each and every last one of us. You know, and people sit here and look at move like you, you don't understand. And I understand you're not understanding because I was you. I was you. I took, and a lot of you is just fucking responsible, irresponsible. You know, because it didn't take me long to find out exactly what Move was talking about. I had two asthmatic children, my two oldest boys. All I had to do was go and on the shelf and get their asthma medicine. You know, it was very few to pick from. Now it's like rows and rows and rows and rows, and you got to go to the doctor and you got to go here and there. Moon was telling us about this. Mm -hmm. They was telling us about this. You know, they was the ones who went at the reservoir. He, and I thought Moon was crazy. Why the hell are you dealing with, <laughs> you know, puppy powers? Why the hell are you demonstrating against the zoo? Why are you demonstrating against the circus? I thought this was the most ridiculous shit I'd ever heard in my life, that you're demonstrating like that. Then I heard what everybody else heard before me, because this government was telling the media and say, move talking their usual rhetoric. That's all you read, move talking their usual rhetoric. They didn't want people to know that what Move was talking about was saving our lives. And uh, stop with the Clean Air Act, because that's exactly what it was. Move explained to me and uh, about the Clean Water Act. It was all a damn act. I'm saying this stuff just went into me. May 19th, Malcolm X's birthday, 1977. I didn't give a damn about what was happening on that corner because I believe in what three, six, 10, 17 was putting out there. Misinformation, misguidance. I learned about the beatings. 
the killing of move babies, the beating of big men. I heard them talk about when they arrested people the night that they killed, not yeah, the night that they killed Janine's baby, that they beat the men so bad. As was an elder tell me, he said he saw him beat Big Jerry to the point he had passed out. They hit Jerry again, and his eyes popped up like this. Why was they beating these people like this? Because they demonstrated at the Board of Education, which a whole lot of people should have been turning that mother sucker out. But they didn't. They didn't have the nerve, the background. You want to hear words of beauty. And uh, when our children was being misused, miseducated in there, and uh, they was warning us about all the horrors of what was going on in them schools. Janie Blackwell did a thing about, you you talking about why a lot of these kids is messed up right now? We allowed this system to give them kitty crack. Kitty crack. I didn't term it that. Janie Blackwell, and I can't think of the sister that wrote at the New Observer. And uh, when move people was exposing all of this, they put it up for a vote. A vote. Janie Blackwell was voted down. She was damned in the community. I'm talking about when they said this kitty crack, and uh, this Ritalin, that's what it was yeah, called, yeah, right. and uh, that it was worse than crack, it was worse than cocaine, and the government, the black elected officials went against Janie Blackwell, you know, for bringing that up. But what I'm saying is long before that, Move told you about it. Move took their children from out of them schools. Didn't need none of their dad one curriculum. They had the curriculum of John Africa. Not one Move child do you see where their um, you know, uh, in fact, people give move people the keys to their houses and stuff. That's the trust that came comes from uh, move people. So a lot of people here can speak on the move children, the ones they didn't kill that day because they wasn't there in the house. And uh, they did not want that example. When Gregor Sambor said that they was combatants, these children are strong. They fit. They sound. They are in the teachings of John Africa. You know, I'm saying, you know, I get a little messed up, you know, a lot of times when I see people, you know, just take for granted of what you say. They're not in jail. They could have did this stuff by their stuff, went all somewhere and did it for themselves. But one thing John Africa told them what I heard on May 20th, 1977, and all that it's the country today, it's a suburban thing tomorrow. This was once a country. I mean, uh, you know, suburbs, suburbs and, you know, that kind of stuff. And uh, so the thing is not to turn and run, but to stand in your grounds. And um, because people didn't stand their grounds, we have all these problems that we have right now in the schools, in the streets. And all uh, you know, and you know, I'm just looking at my sisters and stuff. You know, um, you y'all have no idea. And all uh, you know, and these motherfuckers want our family. I'm excuse me, I'm the one to talk like this, okay? And all uh, you know, you you, you Tell the truth, want man. us oh, the truth. to accept the fucking apology. You know, they got the power right now. My sisters and brothers, the family said, you can't give us nothing. Give us Mumia. Right. We said that when they offered that first apology. And, uh, and I'm saying, right. it's falling on blind ears. That's right. People worried about people being killed, worrying about, and you're supposed to, Floyd, with the, with, with the motherfucker's knee on his, um, you know, and I know you can't print this, but shit, fuck <laughs> <laughs> uh, it. Uh, with his knee on, uh, uh, on, on his neck. What the hell do you think that they're doing to all of us? What do you think that they're doing to Mumia? He keeps with the evidence of innocence, y'all. Yeah. Three, yeah. six, yeah. ten, all of y'all know that. Yeah. Right. You know it. You know, back then they knew of the innocence of my family. But you allowed them to come in here on August 8th, break an agreement that was made before the world. Break that agreement, you know, come into the house, tear the house down on top of them, beat them damn near to death. They don't, didn't only beat the men, they beat the women. You don't hear what happened to Eddie. You don't hear about Young Tuck Africa when he was shot, you know, in that basement, you know? And the, and the fact that he was a young child, young juveniles, he should have been out to jail. Oh, God. I'm saying y'all got to do better. You really got to do better. Investigative journalists, go investigate. My family is saying, let Mumia out. You want to tell the story? Go all the way back. 
Why was moving a confrontation with this on, government? Why right. police brutality? Right. And uh, movers heading at the people that's killing all of us. Corporate right. America, they put them fucking pawns in our way. And uh, the mayor, the governor, the president. Right. And uh, you know, they put them in our way. The police is there to beat anybody who is telling the truth. That's right. And that's right. moving. That's right. and, uh, and will not compromise. <clears throat> all through the prisons, the changes. The changes that move made inside them prisons. When they took move people to jail, I'm saying it's a lot of mothers, fathers and shit is glad. You know, not glad that they went to jail, but glad that they were there and are dealing with their children. And are dealing with their husbands. Their, you know, the lives that were saved in the prison because of move. And uh, you know, people want to tell the story of move and uh, and understand. And our move is very sensitive to life, very sensitive to life. And I'm saying, you know, mm, mm, mm. and I want to make it clear because people misunderstand things. I am, and uh, I got yeah, this thing with um with Billy Cook, and uh, my brother was just giving you examples. Billy Cook did not kill Faulkner. Right. He did not kill Fox. I know how things get twisted and shit. Right. And also, I want to make it very clear. You know, he did not come to court. And you know, because when he got out of jail, when he went to court, you know, to be in a spectator for Mumia, he would look at your records. They document everything. They beat him up and his other brother up and threw them out. When it came time for the post conviction hearing, you uh, know, they again stopped Billy from coming in. Billy wanted to testify. He wanted to testify. He wanted to be there for his brother. But they took one over the other. And uh, because they want to focus on Mumia. That's right. And uh, and tell you this, you, nobody even really did this, right? If you go back into your newspaper, mm. go to the end of November 1981, and uh, and you will see we were in court with our family members, Alberta. Carlos mm -hmm. and other move members, right? Um, we were told, um, they, the media was told not to cover this case. We were consistently bringing people into that courtroom. First, they beat up my sister Rhonda and, uh, and Teresa, mm -hmm. and uh, because we was exposing what was going on in the courtroom right outside City Hall, and Mumia was with us. And uh, they kept on every day, it was um, Rhonda first, and then Rhonda got back out, you know, Teresa got back out, and we demonstrating again. They beat us so bad in City Hall. I'm telling you, Mumi was with us. The last person that they had to get off this case was Mumi Abu Jamal. He was December the 9th, 1981. Go into your records and see what was going on at that time. Anybody that was speaking out on Alberta's trial, they was taking them out the way. And they couldn't stop us because we was packing that courtroom. We was after the judge. When he got off the train, we was there. And all uh, you know, so that's what happened to Mumia. That's what happened to Mumia. He was doing, and uh, people were saying, you know, well, we was told not to. That's why we're not covering the story. And, uh, but he was a freelance journalist, and he knew it was something that had to be out. Mumia was true to us, and we were very true to Mumia. That's, right. That's why. Oh, oh. Y'all right? Yes, y'all right. Okay. That's why we said, and uh, you can't bring none of our family members back. But what we're demanding, and we're demanding of each and every last one of you, to take the story back. Let people know what it is that we're demanding and why we're demanding. We're not demanding it just because it's Mumia Abu Jamal. We have the evidence of innocence. Right. Like he had the evidence of innocence on our family right. and tried to stop the murder of them right. and all of us. So, you know, well, and what you look at. Anything, questions, anything come up, we ask that you come directly to Mumia organization to get the move organization's position on yeah. and that's that's about it i cannot take any more i really can't
what I like, what I like, what I like, what I like, what I like. Wow. Sorry, everybody. Good Lord. Oh, my God. Ah. Ah, sorry, everybody. Oh, my goodness. And I had blocked the comments, so I didn't get distracted. So I didn't even see everybody trying to do all this to tell me I've been talking in silence for so long. So first of all, let me apologize for that. Again, rookie mistake. It's so frustrating that I do that. And let me thank you all for trying to alert me. And thank you all for sticking around and not leaving, uh, even though you couldn't hear anything. Mm, mm, mm. Mm. 
Anyone read lips? Yeah, I hear you. This, yeah, I appreciate the jokes. I appreciate it. I appreciate it. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I deserve all of that. Anyway, so here's here's what I was saying. Oh man! First of all, I was saying how horrible it is that, uh, um, as much as we want to be in solidarity with 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 Move and uh, and of course Mumia, it's 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 horrible to have to hear these stories. Uh, and um, uh, you know, uh, it, it it was uh, you know painful to watch the press conference. I can't imagine the pain of those involved uh, in 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 having to suffer these experiences. Um, and uh, um, obviously, we stand in solidarity with the Move movement and. Um, Uh, yeah, anyway, let me, let me get myself back together here after messing up like that for so long. Oh my goodness. That's terrible. Anyway, what I was trying to say is that we stand in solidarity with move. We were, you know, uh, um, uh, and that if you were with us on the remix morning show last week, you saw that Pam Africa came on, uh, and, um, uh, you know, more or less broke the story from Move's perspective with us that morning. And uh, so when we heard about the press conference, wanted to at least try to to support it, uh, even though we had a stream, you know, scheduled for today coming up in a few minutes. In fact, I uh, wanted to support the Move, uh, you, you know, effort to get that word out. And uh, maybe after our interview with Dr. Peter Hudson about racial capitalism and the origins of uh racial capitalism or the Southern African, the South African, the lesser, lesser known South African origins of racial capitalism. Uh, you know, maybe after that interview, we'll come back and talk about some of the stuff that I had planned to start off the show with uh, today uh, before we got word of that press conference and uh, that started at 11 a.m. So if you missed any of it, uh, the link is in the description below. Uh, and, uh, please go back and check it out in its entirety. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit more about it later today, uh, and we'll continue to stay in touch with, with, uh, Pam Africa and the move movement and move organization, uh, and try to follow the story as much as possible and support the work, uh, uh you know, uh, is, um, whatever they try to do, uh, in, in response. So, um, so I'm going to come back. I don't want to take too much time up. We, our, 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 our guest is is here and I want to get to, to, to him in just a second. But uh, so, again, I apologize about that, 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 you know, horrific uh, rookie mistake of not, um, you know, but I will see. <laughs> but the one thing I did want to say is going back years, talk about the, you know, uh, what should not be an issue for me at this point, but going back some years, um, when when in uh, Northwest Washington, D.C., I was still doing uh, a shout out to Radio CPR, my 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 very first uh, radio program in the low power, unsanctioned uh, um, uh, uh, unsanctioned low powered FM radio world. I happened to have a show at the time when um the uh it wasn't really hurricane katrina because if we remember the initial reports were accurate that the 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 worst of the storm missed the city but it was all of the ravages of of and maybe i ask you know our, our next guest what what he thinks about this in terms of 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 racial capitalism but it was really the context in which that hurricane hit those people that caused the problem and i happened to have a, a broadcast right as as this was going on and i remember going on the air and looking at what was happening to particularly black folks down there and and hearing some of the reports that didn't come out in in white presses for years uh you know nobody not many people heard that broadcast i was doing and that others were doing but we were among the first to point out the fact that black people were being sniped that black people were being hunted down that there was all kinds of problems with the police and what they were doing unofficially down there a lot of stuff that came out years later uh you know and i think got some white journalism awards was being reported by people like me on the low uh you know you know um uh and, and shout out to my man sincere and people who are actually there you know who who were who were getting the real story out um uh you know uh anyway 
but 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 my point was there is that then I remember thinking, you know, I said something to the effect like this, this should be the last straw, like, you know, to the extent that the last straw theory is real. Um, or as most deaf said, it's really the million, the th- million straws underneath it. It's all mathematics. That should have been the last straw. Well, when when I, I've, I have that same sense of feeling now. Uh, even after all the COVID and all the other stuff, it's 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 stories like these when they come out, the additional horrors. Uh, and I do want us to go through that article a little later on, um, the, the Billy Penn piece, uh, a little more carefully uh, to talk more about that. But um, hold up, are you all still saying there's no sound? No. Hold on, check with me. Yeah, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah, 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 yeah. Um, Hesperia, if I'm mis- not, forgive me if I'm mispronouncing your name. Check, check. Yeah, okay, yeah. You should be here. Everything should be. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, good, good, good. Anyway, so when I when we hear stories like this about the 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 collection and the housing for decades of the the bones of these murdered. Um, move members and children. I mean, you know, like what, what, how, you know, anyway, I have that sense today. Anyway, the, the, that, that sense of this, should, these, these should be the last straw uh, in terms of any number of things or our attachments uh, to things. So, um, but very quickly, I did want to quickly say, we are trying to have a push to get to, to some more um, black power media patrons uh for a number of reasons and i just want to say quickly uh please make sure you've signed up for the email list at blackpowermedia.org and that you're following all of the the uh, the the social media outlets um and if you can financially support do so either the channel is great but also consider through patreon because uh and i just want to share this this story that came out the other day because it's something we've been we've been um wanting to follow here very carefully. Uh, and as it's hitting the the white left now, we should expect that it's going to hit us uh, sooner than later. Um, but we've been warning about, you know, YouTube is, is you know, theoretically uh, in many ways great and offers an opportunity for us to do what we're doing. But it is also, uh, you know, a part of the increasingly uh, consolidating uh, corporate environment of our of media uh, that has a very particular purpose, as we've been trying to also talk a lot more about here, not just in terms of propaganda or psychological warfare, but the suppression uh, of counterinsurgency efforts do- uh, abroad and domestically and including within Black, specifically Black America. So, uh, it was reported the other day or earlier this month, rather, that the YouTube CEO said it's easy to make up content and post it from your basement. So we we boost authoritative sources. So in other words, this was an acknowledgement by the U- the CEO of YouTube that they do have algorithms and me- methods and ways to boost what they consider to be authoritative sources and suppress others so that uh, and that ultimately what what is happening is uh, uh Alternative sources are not only being suppressed, but they're being deplatformed and removed, demonetized, subscribers removed, uh, all kinds of things going on. Uh, so we will come back to this in, in greater detail, maybe later today or maybe in you know future shows, maybe on the Remix Morning Show uh, um, to talk more about the specifics. But but my immediate point for bringing it up now is that the more people we have supporting us in other venues, or, or other ways, the more we will be able to reach out to folks should something happen here and we get, you know, YouTubed. <laughs> so we would at least want to be able to reach out to folks. So if you can, if you, if, obviously, if, if you can, you know, support with whatever financially, you know, you can every whatever, sign up for one of the tiers, either at the channel here or at Patreon. And if you, uh, or at least sign up for the emails uh, at blackpowermedia.org. So in case something happens, we can still reach out and, and let everybody know what, what the, the collective is doing. All right. Um, that said, so I want to get to our next guest, uh, somebody uh, who's, who's, who's work, um, like many people over the years, I just am just behind. I'm, I'm just, I'm just, I just can't keep up with everything. Um, so I'm very glad that he was willing to come on today and that, uh, 
uh, there's at least some of what he's written on this available for 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 me and for us to to try to catch up to, uh, and then more out there that we can uh, uh, you know subsequent to this conversation uh, uh, get up on as well, and hopefully we'll you know his presence here will be more than uh, just this one off and more routine. Uh, and by that, I'm talking about Professor Peter James Hudson, who, among many other things, is a professor of history and African American studies at UCLA and author of Banking on America, uh, sorry, Banking on Empire, Wall Street and the West Indies, 1873 to 1933. I, I, I have not read that book yet. Only an article he wrote about the book. I want to get to that some today and more later because it, 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 <laughs> it suggests to be uh, uh, um, sort of an endless font of interest and fascination. So, but uh, uh, but today specifically, I want to uh, talk with him about um, a piece that he wrote uh, not too long ago, at least, uh, titled "To Remake the World: Slavery, Racial Capitalism, and Justice: Racial Capitalism in the Dark Proletariat." And uh, uh, to do that, let's bring on Professor Hudson now. Good morning, sir. Thank you for joining me and us. Appreciate you. Welcome. Well, good, good morning. Thank you for having me on, and thank you for the work that you're doing uh, with the show with uh, Black Power Media uh, in general. And I, I just want to uh, second your call to support independent Black media. It's, it's so crucial. Uh, you're the only voice we have out there. So, uh, you know, hit those like buttons, send the money. Right and I on. think importantly, people got to write for these for these uh, for these publications and and be part of it mm. in a more active way. So. Thank you for everything you're doing. It's good to be here. No, I appreciate that. And and please do listen to our guests and hit the like buttons and subscribes and all that shares and all that stuff. So listen, so there's a lot of places, as I always say at the beginning, uh, you know, uh, there's a lot of places we can go and there's there's a lot to, to cover in, in whatever time we have. So if I don't, you know, elicit something that you want us to get to, uh, uh, you know, on my own, please bring us there. But, but uh, at some point, but I did, if I could, we wanted to start with where you start in the article I mentioned just a minute ago, because, uh, you know, until I got put onto it, honestly, through Dr. CBS, uh, um, I, I, I just did, you know, I, I, you know, anyway, but you start off by saying at least one early on in the piece, you say, quote, our idea of racial capitalism, as Walter Johnson explains, comes from Cedric Robinson's Black Marxism in 1983. But it has another lineage, one that predates Robinson, even as it emerges from the same tradition of Black radical thought to which he belonged. In October 1979, an unsigned essay titled Neo-Marxism and the Bogus Theory of Racial Capitalism appeared in Equazy, a Black liberation journal of South African and Southern African political analysis, Published in London, the journal offered a radical alternative to the politics of both the African National Congress and the South African Communist Party. Equazi's take on racial capitalism is clear from the title. The concept is not to be celebrated and embraced as a critical counterweight to European Marxism. Instead, it is a product of European Marxists' attempt to co-opt and condition Black liberation struggles in Southern Africa, Southern Africa end quote. So the first time I read that, I had to read like six, seven, eight times. I was like, I was like, because it's like, damn, there's so much that is just in that, 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 that the petty and the hater in me would love to run off with in terms of how <laughs> racial capitalism is, you know, but, but what is really, what is it that you're, you're, you're beginning to invite us to, to understand with that, that sort of introduction there? Uh, yeah, in terms, yeah. Yeah. Thank you. I, I mean, let me, let me start, let me back up a bit and say a couple things first. I mean, I know that you, before I came on, you were talking about this, the, the recent news around the remains of mm. who have been shuttled back and forth between uh, Penn and, and Princeton and held by these individual act, uh, academics and, and used by, um, uh, used to teach as, as basically pedagogical tools in, in these white elite institutions. And I just got to say that this for me and for my family over the last couple of days has been utterly disturbing mm. for us. Um, and I think it's, it's particularly embarrassing for me um, as an academic, uh, seeing what other academics are doing with the remains of black people. I mean, this is just reprehensible. And I think that feeds into a kind of political economy of racial capitalism uh, in, in the university in terms of how uh, black bodies are seen, black bodies are used, uh, black people circulate. Now, the, the, for the for the article, I, I should also say that that 
you know, my interest in, in, in racial capitalism, like I think a lot of people, um, came primarily through Cedric Robinson's work in, in Black Marxism. I think it was, it's a kind of gateway uh, drug to, to, to thinking about racial capitalism um, and it, its uses. And as, as we know, that book first came out in 1983 and then was reissued in about 2007. Um, um, when I started doing serious research. And so everyone is talking about it, everyone's using it. And, and in my, my book, in the book that you mentioned, Bankers and Empire, uh, what I, I tried to do in, in that book was to understand how the expansion of Wall Street into the Caribbean as a practice of imperialism, as a practice of finance capitalism, was also a practice of white supremacy, of, of racialism, of, of racial capitalism. And so at the time that I was writing the book, um, uh, you know, Robinson's uh, work was available. Um, I was trying to, to, to use some of the ideas in there to understand how, um, how banks operated, how financial institutions operated. But I have to say that at, at the end of the day, I realized that the, um, the formulation of racial capitalism that Robinson um, was, was putting forth wasn't really working for me. And it wasn't working for me because if there's anything inherently wrong with what Robinson was doing, it, was, it wasn't working for me simply because he doesn't approach the question of finance capitalism and banking and Citibank and Chase mm -hmm. and all these kind of institutions. So, you know, instead of trying to, trying to I, I think I was trying to force Robinson to do certain things that he simply doesn't attempt to do, doesn't say that he's trying to do. And so around the time, uh, near the time the book was coming out, I started to, to I, and I can't remember how this happened, but I kind of, realized that, well, there, there was these other, um, uh, other people using the term racial capitalism. I think I had simply done uh, a search of the UCLA, UCLA Library catalog for racial capitalism um, and came across this, this pamphlet by these two white South Africans um, on, on racial capitalism that was published in 1977. And that got me thinking, and I was like, man, okay, there, what, what's going on here? What was happening in, 19, in the 1970s? Are there other sources? And then, you know, you start digging and you start digging and you start digging and you find out that this is a term that's being debated within the South African Communist Party or as, as you kind of, as you point out from the intro, it's being uh, dismissed by the South African Communist Party because they see it as a kind of um, a, a, a deviation from um, a pure Stalinist line, effectively. Um, you, you realize that it's being picked up, uh, the term racial capitalism is also being picked up by uh, black consciousness activists who are very influenced by, um, by, by George Padmore, um, obviously by Steve Biko, and they're realizing that the kind of classic terms of, of Marxism uh, aren't working um, for their understanding of the South African situation, and that black nationalism isn't necessarily working because it, they don't see it as having enough of a class analysis. And so you begin to see in activist literature, in different journals, um, at different different speeches that uh, in South Africa, different for different organizations, this term racial capitalism starts starts coming around. For me, um, it's in journals like Equesi, which has a kind of negative take on on it, um, uh, but also in, in the work of people like um, uh, uh, Neville Alexander, uh, who wrote, wrote extensively about uh, racial cap capitalism, uh, Bernard Magubane. Um, John Saul, who's a, a white Canadian Marxist who, who wrote about it. And so from about 1977 to 1983, there's this kind of explosion of work on, on racial capitalism that predates and then in some ways aligns or, or kind of um, parallels what Robinson was doing in, uh, in 1983. So it, it became important to me um, as someone who studies uh, and is a student of the history of black ra radicalism you know, you can't simply suppress this literature. You can't simply say, well, Robinson owns this term. You have to say, well, what are these other people doing? How are they using it for? What are the differences between how they're using it and how Robinson's using it? And, and one of the key differences I saw, and I think part of what I, what I say in the piece is that they are using the term uh, racial capitalism to think through the particularities of the South African situation right, um, under the, the history of apartheid and even before apartheid, whereas Robinson is really thinking about racial capitalism as this kind of global term, a, a kind of universal term. I also think what, what they're doing is they're understanding the, the, the racial capitalism through the methodology of political economy, 
whereas as um, Robinson is more interested in the question of, of political philosophy. And I think, you know, you had this brother on your show the other day who wrote the book on Marxism and, and black liberation, talking about where he was kind of complaining about Robinson. Yeah, Frank Chapman, yeah. Frank Chapman, you know, and he made the point. He's like, well, I, he said, I don't see uh, Robinson as a historical materialist. And in some ways, uh, I don't think Robinson is. I think Chapman is, is on point there. And I think that we have to we we have to be able to distinguish between you know we have to be able to say that Robinson and Magabane or Neville Alexander are not doing the same thing. They may be both committed to black liberation, but their lens of understanding the hows and whys of of white supremacy and capitalism are different, and they're going to get somewhat different answers. Um, I know some people are saying that I'm I've created a dangerous opposition between Robinson and Neville Alexander between Robinson and the South African. I'm like, I'm not creating a fucking dangerous op op opposition. I'm simply saying different people are doing different things. And as scholars, as, as scholars of Pan-Africanism, of black radical tradition, we have to understand all of those things. And the final thing I, I would say um, about this is what Robinson doesn't do, and I think this is critically important, and what the South Africans are trying to do is there, they look in a very, very, very serious way about imperialism in the history of South Africa, imperialism in the history of, of black liberation and a critique of imperialism in, in, in the history of black liberation. And they don't do this in terms of a kind of just rhetorical flourishing that, you know, the USA is imperialist. They're, they're like, no, let's look very clearly at how US investment capital enters via the South African state into South African corporations to then support the counter, the the the, um, uh, the suppression of counterinsurgency in the rest of, of, of Southern Africa. Bernard Magubane calls uh, South Africa the citadel of racial capitalism in Africa, not simply because of the, the, the large white population, um, but also and not simply because it's the most kind of developed industrially nation in, in Africa, but because it's also a kind of node for the, the transfer of, of imperial power through, to, through the rest of the region. And I think that it's important to reclaim that, that very nuanced, that very granular, that very uh, materialist understanding of imperialism when we evoke this, this term racial capitalism. And that's something I was trying to do in my book and I'm trying to do, I think, in, in all my, my work. Just quickly, Bernard Magu Magubane, did he, th I read, years ago i think it's the making of the racist state is that wasn't that yeah yeah that's one of his did he talk about racial capitalism in that book he doesn't he talks about racial capitalism in a series of books in a series of articles that uh appeared in i think the Braudel journal in rethinking mm. in marxism um and and i don't see uh Magubane really using the term after 1983 i'm i'm reading right now his uh, uh race in the i think it's race in the political economy or or the political economy of race in South Africa, which comes out in the in the mid '80s, and I don't don't see him using that. Even though you can see he's he's trying to work, kind of operationalize the context, the concept through his his reading of, of political economy. But uh, in the 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 making of the racial state, I don't think he uses that term. Okay, yeah, I was just yeah. Anyway, so forgive me if you if you already somewhat addressed this, but one of the quotes I pulled out uh, from your article, I think, gets to the point. At least one of the points you were you were raising here. You said that because. Because you start with quoting the journal Equazy, but then you suggest right. that they got something wrong uh, right. in there. And and because you write that um, uh, Equazy gets it wrong in many ways. Uh, uh, Legasic and Hemson, two of the, I guess, the European Marxists they're criticizing, yeah. do not argue that South African racialism was the creation of capitalism. They, uh, they argue instead that modern manifestations of racism were historically contingent on the shifting regimes of capital accumulation in South Africa and the response of the South African state to it. They suggest that the racism of British colonialism and Dutch settler colonialism was reorganized within 19th century discovery of gold in, uh, in the with, wa with water stand, with waters, I, I'm not saying that correctly, with South Africa's early 20th century industrialization and with it, its attempts to secure multinational investment capital after the formation, formal adoption of apartheid in 1949. So, I guess what I what what I wanted you to to, to more ex lay out for us is is well I don't know why is it that what is it that Equazy is getting wrong where does Cedric Robinson's view of of racial capitalism fit in with with what you're describing there 
um, and, and are you, and then if I, am I understanding the same thing that you were, would then be saying the same thing about Robinson that he's missing this point in his work? Um, and, yeah. So, so and I'm not trying to, I'm not trying to, I'm not trying to, to be on the spot here. No, no, I'm, but I'm, I'm just trying to understand because elsewhere I got it elsewhere. I got in some, some trouble online, not in some trouble, but I was trying to ask because for instance, in an article from Sharice Bird and Steli, she raises a question about does does Robinson misunderstand the ways in which black communists have, have attempted to use communism or Marxism in their work? So so to suggest that he, you know, he might have just misunderstood that in his critic condemnation of black, of, you know, of Marxism for black people. And I'm wondering, is this is this a part, I mean, methodologically for him, something that that he's missing? in this piece here uh, that you're talking about here anyway. Yeah. I, so I, I think, I mean, you know, I think one of the things that you're, you're pointing to is the, the, in, in the dark, in that dark finance, in that dark, uh, whatever proletariat essay that you're referring to, it's, it's a difficult piece because I set up this thing with Equesi and then as you point out, kind of say, well, actually they got it wrong. So you're kind of walking through it and then I, I kind of pull the rug out for you. So in some ways it's, it's unfair to, to readers in terms of how the, how the, the, the piece is structured. Um, and part of that came out of really just like discovering material as I'm writing it and like kind of being blown away by, by, by all this kind of stuff that I had no idea existed. I'm sure a lot of other people knew it was there, but it was all new for, for me. But I think that what, what the, the, the distinction that, that the people in Equesi are trying to make um, or, or the critiques that they have of Legasic and Henson and other fears of, of racial capitalism is down to the question of the origins of racism in its relationship to capitalism. And I think what, what, what the folks at Equesi are doing is they have a kind of like dogmatic party line and they even say at one point that the correct reading of the racial and national situation is in South Africa is what was laid out by comrade Stalin. You know, and we don't need to, to deviate what Stalin wrote. He understood it. He gets it. Whereas other people are trying to say, well, you know, without kind of going into the kind of weeds of, of the, the, the national question in, in communist theory, oftentimes it gets, it's, it's, it's cast as racism, white supremacy is something that emerges out of class conflict. And, and it, it emerges out of class conflict because the, 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 the bourgeois are using racism to pit the white and the black working classes together. And so, the, so racism is simply instrumentalized in this moment to say, yeah, at, at the moment when capitalism is, is forming, you know, you want to keep the, the, uh, the wages of labor down. The way to do that is to create these different racialized pools of labor that are always fighting against each other you know, and, and are willing to work at the lowest possible wage, which is possibly true, but I don't think, I don't think that racism is merely the kind of creation of an evil genius of capitalism to pit workers against each other. And what Legasic and Hempson are saying, what, what folks I think like George Padmore are saying, what people like Bernard Magubani are saying, what other people are saying, well, we have to understand that there's a history of racism uh, in, South, in the South African context anyway, that predates the formation of capitalism in South Africa that is, comes from the legacy of British colonialism. How this relates to, to Robinson, I think, is again the question of how do we understand the origins of, racials, of, of racism? How do we understand the origins of white supremacy? How do we understand the, the fact that when we, we, when we start at a certain moment, start to think of a slave, we imagine it's an African? Right. And what I don't understand in Robinson, and I, this is not a critique of, of, of Robinson. This is simply I don't understand this. Robinson says, if, I, if I'm reading him correctly, that um, the, 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 the origins of racialism can be found in the, the kind of almost inter-ethnic European struggles uh, of, of feudalism, the kind of all the different European ethnicities were marked by uh, an emerging capitalist state um, as, as racialized. And then this becomes the foundational uh, kind of practice of, of racialization that we see then in full-blown capitalism. My question for that is, 
for, for if, and if Robinson was alive, I, I would ask him this is, well, how do you go from those modes of racialization to the specific modes of anti-blackness that we begin to see emerging uh, with the slave trade? Furthermore, how do we understand this question of, of racism emerging at that moment in time with the fact that W.E.B. Du Bois and others have said, well, racism becomes even more virulent after slavery. It becomes worse during the, the period of, of, of scientific racism, where there's a whole academic a apparatus that is now working to justify the, 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 the uh, uh, inferiority of, of black people. And this is something that's you know, occurring through the 19th century into the, into the present, when, you know, into, during the moment when Rayford Logan speaks of the nadir of race relations in, in the United States. So something's happening here where we can, we can maybe say something was, there, there was some kind of you know, germinal moment of racialization in feudal Europe that then gets translated into the anti-blackness of the slave trade, but then gets intensified under, under the regimes of white supremacy after reconstruction in the post-emancipation era up to our present one could say. But then the, if you say that to me, that messes up our origin stories. But it also then messes up our, our, the kind of the political story we tell around, around racism. And we have to then rethink what happened in the 19th century. Rethink what happened in, in, uh, uh, during and after reconstruction. Uh, or rethink the kind of claims that W.E.B. Du Bois is making black reconstruction and then in, in dark water, water around the origins of, of racism and its ties to capitalism. So I'm, I, I, um, I mean, I think we, I, I don't know the answer to this and, and I, I, I think we, we still need to, to think about what we're doing here, but I, I think I'm, I'm trying to just pose some questions here, you know, and, and, and I also think that, you know, it's, it's funny because I, I wrote that piece and then a piece emerged and it said, well, you know, what does Cedric Robinson mean by racial capitalism? And it becomes very important then to do this almost biblical exegesis of, <laughs> of Robinson's work to say, well, he's got the truth of racial capitalism. And then other people are now in the Boston Review saying, well, it's actually racial. Who cares what racial cap what Robinson thought about racial capitalism? That's not important in his work. It's racialism. And so now we have to shift over to this. And I'm like, this is a very weird use of a scholar to me. I mean, I don't think we need to, to put any of, any of these people on a pedestal, whether it's Robinson or Du Bois or Angela Davis. Let's look at their work. Let's see if the work works for us. Let's see what the flaws in the work are, you know, and keep revising it and, and talking about it um, until we get the, you know, until we get what will be a kind of conti contingent and conjunctural understanding of this intellectual work that you know that will serve black liberation in a particular moment in time i don't think it's, it will serve in all moments in time but mm. in a particular moment in time and i think we need to to just develop some nuance here and stop deifying some of some of these folks actually that's a, I, I actually really like that point about what will work right now specific to this situation <laughs> yeah. um yeah um and the the it, Again, I think you covered it, but one of the other quotes I pulled out from your, your piece here talking about Du Bois was that uh, in, in Black Reconstruction in America in 1935, he called the dark proletariat uh, racialized toilers whose historical presence dislodges the pretension of a universal working class subject who is invariably white. Instead, the struggle for freedom and justice begins with the black worker, end quote. Um, the reason I think I pulled that out was because I'm wondering, is this something then that you're saying or that we could say all of these folks agree on? Is this is this one of the points that everybody's particular approach to? to I, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I, I'd say that that uh, I mean, in Robinson's work and, and Du Bois's work, and the work of so many other people, it is about recentering uh, the, the black worker, the black subject, black people, you know, and understanding how you know, the, the, the formation of capitalism uh, um, affected us. Um, I think what's also important is it's what happens after that quote in, in the, the piece. And it's something that, mm. that I think I'm struggling with and a lot of other people are struggling with. And some people are doing a very good job of writing about, which is it's not just about replacing the, the, uh, the white male worker with the black male worker. It's about also talking about the politics of, of gender in that and where are our black women as workers in this. And I think that the kind of um, incredible work that black feminist historians of slavery 
people like Jessica Marie Johnson, uh, Marisa Puentes, Jennifer Morgan, um, and, and others have, have been doing um, since Angela Davis wrote her very famous essay for the Black scholar on the Black woman's role in the community of slaves. I think that, that that's the kind of pioneering um, and innovative work that, that goes farther, further than Robinson, further than Du Bois, further than definitely my, mm. myself in terms of understanding, you know, how do we center, who should be the center of the histories of racial capitalism? And if we suddenly, if, if we incorporate questions of, of gender and, and the, the role of the black woman's body in the reproduction of capitalism, that kind of shatters everything in, in some ways. And then again, what does, what do our kind of practices of, of liberation uh, look like? Um, though I think, you know, obviously black feminist scholars are better placed to answer those questions than, than I am. Right on. Fair enough. Um, and, 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 and to your point, the, 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 the article that you wrote does uh, raise that. Uh, and you mentioned a number of those uh, scholars in your work. Um, absolutely. And in fact, I, you know, I'm going to just start tracing some of that and catching up to some of their work and inviting them here uh, as well. So one of the questions that I had when in reading this is in, 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 in several other pieces, actually, is I keep coming back to, you know, and, and I think some of this might just be my defensiveness over not fully grasping everything, especially in the first run of reading it. But but why why what what's wrong with terms like colonialism or internal colonialism to describe all of these problems? Um, you know, why do we need racial capitalism or what other all these other variations? Uh, so I was just wondering if, if, if you know, because I don't always understand until maybe I'm reading something and comparing it directly or getting help through talking to somebody about it, what these differences are. So what, for instance, what is racial capitalism in any of these approaches telling us about the situation that uh, the simple description from, you know, you know, that existed before of colonialism or internal colonialism doesn't address? Is is there something? Or is <laughs> you know, I, th I think that's, that's a good question. And I, and, and I, I think what, what you're pointing to is, you know, people will throw out terms just for the sake of throwing out terms, right? And and I think that there's in some ways there's a kind of currency or or a market in in terms where you know you academics love to say, well, I coined the phrase blah blah blah, right? right? And it's like, well, no, this is something that many other people have been have been talking mm -hmm. about in in different ways. And and why do you need to have to attach yourself to to this specific trademarked term? I, I don't I don't get it. I think with with racial capitalism, um, I and I'm. You know, I've I've used the term. Um, I've I've struggled with 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 the term, um, and I I think that the term has a certain kind of importance. And I think the importance of the term racial capitalism. You know, people will say, well, um, capitalism is always racist, and and I'll, and I'd say, well, I I agree with that, but people don't always recognize that capitalism is always racist. So so you might say, well, racial capitalism is redundant, but I would say that it's actually heuristic, that it actually helps you identify something. So it, it's more of a kind of attacking racial onto capitalism allows us a kind of polemical understanding to illuminate what for some people is, isn't still illuminated. It, mm -hmm. it hasn't been illuminated, right? <clears throat> I do think we need to, to create um, I think, first of all, we need to regain some of the language that you're, you're talking about. I think that, that we need to talk seriously about what colonialism is as something that's both a part of but distinct from capitalism as, some, as, as the management of, of overseas territories. I think we need to think about um, the, the you know, return to, to the great work on the internal colony thesis and internal co uh, colonialism to understand uh, the situation of African Americans right now. Um, and I think that that becomes a very important thing, especially around the, the role of, of black elites in the United States who in many ways um, act as the kind of uh, gatekeepers um, and uh, intermediaries between uh, black populations and white capital and, and the white state. And, and, a, and a colonial or internal colonial model allows us to understand that relationship in a way that racial capitalism writ large doesn't. So, so I think that, the, you know, what's, what's important um, is not necessarily to dismiss any of these terms, but just to have a kind of analytical clarity when, when we're using them, you know, and I think one of my frustrations over the last year is seeing racial capitalism is everywhere now. I mean, you can, you can write about Disneyland, it's racial capitalism, you get your teeth cleaned, 
racial capitalism. You know, you, I mean, it's like everything is is racial, and so if everything is racial capitalism, what does it actually mean? You yeah. know, and and what how are people actually using it? And again, going back to to the the initial questions, this is I think what's important um, about the the kind of work that the South Africans doing is that they they're very very nuanced in terms of racial capitalism, not just as a kind of pithy catchphrase, but as a methodology. Um, mm -hmm. And I know that, um, you know, uh, two scholars, two historians, uh, uh, Destin Jenkins and um, uh, Justin Leroy have just uh, co-edited a book called Histories of Racial Capitalism. And I think in their introduction, they're very careful <clears throat> about trying to kind of um, work through racial capitalism as that kind of methodology, and, and, and mm. uh, they're very deliberative about that. So I think that's that's what uh, uh, that's what needs to be done um, with, with those terms. Right on. Okay, very good. Appreciate that. I got a uh, it's just more to catch up to. Um, so speaking of which, going sort of working now, I got sort of kind of working backwards to to work you've already done that I still have to fully catch up to. I. One of the books that I, uh, Marisa Baradaran's The Color of Money is, 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 is one of the books I had to spend a lot of time with over the last couple of years or year and a half or whatever. And, and one of the points that, that, that I learned a lot from her is this, this question of, um, uh, the, the role of banks in, in, uh, so when I was when I was you know reading your the, at least this article and then trying to get a grasp of what you were doing with, with this book, um, you know, one of the lines that I got from Barada Ron is that she she was talking about like, you know, something like black people wanted freedom, but quote, they instead they got a bank, um, you know, like like the bank is going to bring bring you your freedom. So so when I was just looking at just at the title of your book, Banking on Empire, Wall Street and West Indies, I was wondering as it relates, obviously, to the West Indies, but just in general, from your in the work that you were doing here, what is the role of a bank and what what does it what what is what do banks do? Uh, when they get involved with, well, in this case, African populations or poor populations or those in struggle. Uh, anyway. Yeah. <clears throat> I mean, I think um, I'd, I'd say two things. And in, in the first instance, you know, thinking about the color of money um, and the work around, say, the Freedmen's uh, uh, Savings Bank uh, uh, during Reconstruction, um, and then the kind of discourse around black banking um, that, that we've seen, you know, throughout the 20th century into the, into the, uh, the, the, the current century, that there's a sense or, or there's an idea that what banks are able to do is, you know, they're, they're institutions that are able to pool the money or the capital um, of, of a community to use it to, to benefit that community or to benefit individuals in that community. And so that if, you know, you're basically, banks are, are institutions that should allow you to extend, you as an individual or as a community to extend the credit and capital that you have to do certain kinds of projects, right? That's a kind of ideal sense. So, you know, you, you, you put your money into the, 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 you know, you, when you put money into the, into the bank, um, that money, instead of sitting in your pocket being an active, should ideally be um, uh, 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 gaining interest and it's gaining interest because it's being lent out to do projects in the community that are then making money, right? And so obviously now um, you put your money in the saving, a savings bank, there's no interest. It's, it's probably negative interest. And, and then if you add the fees onto it, you're basically giving the bank money to hold your money, you know, whereas back in the day that the idea was that, that, that um, you know, bankers would attract you to a savings account because you would get interest and that would swell their capital resources that then they could go build a school you could go renovate your house th this kind of thing so so they they become intermediaries right between uh the, between individuals and businesses between individuals uh between businesses and businesses that allow you to uh expand uh what what credit you have i would say though that that banks in the more in the formal sense are not the only ways of doing this. And I think, you know, there's, in, in the Caribbean anyway, there's a whole tradition of, of like rotating credit associations that are, are informal uh, banking practices where people would just pool their money, there would be no interest involved, there'd be no fees involved, and everyone would be able to pull it out, pull their money out at one 
one point during a calendar cycle to, to fix their roof or, or build their house or whatever. So, you know, we, we should always remember that there's um, other traditions of, of, of informal uh, uh, non-regulated banking institutions. Now, the second thing I would say about banking, <clears throat> and this actually goes back to the question of imperialism. When we think about what imperialism is, it's not just, you know, like the Roman Empire or the British Empire or, or this kind of thing. Imperialism coming out of, the, if we look at the work of Hilferding and Lenin and other people, is a specific moment in the history of capitalism that, that witnesses the transition from, on one, from, from, on one hand, mercantile or commercial capitalism based around trade to industrial capitalism built around uh, the expansion of, of industry. And with that expansion of industry, the emergence of finance capitalism. And finance capitalism is the, the kind of um, the, the pooling of and, and concentration of wealth, of, of capital in the coffers of banking institutions. And so suddenly banks, where they used to have this kind of more traditional role of just lending money, are actually growing larger and they have a, an outsized role in the uh, in in the economy, so that they're not just lending money to industry; they're actually directing what industry is going to look like. They're going to um, um, decide that okay, well, you know, they're they're gonna they're gonna um, accelerate innovation by by funding cer certain projects or or decelerate it, it, uh, innovation by by taking money out of certain projects. But, but the, what's important about about finance capital um, finance capitalism is that banking power is exceeds industrial power. Mm. Banking, the, the, the role of banks, the role of Wall Street is bigger than that of the steel companies or the oil companies or, or whatever you have. This, this is really crucial. And we see this right now just um, in, a, in a very simple way. I don't know if, if you follow what's going on in, in European soccer where there was this huge kind of... Uh, uh, you know what I'm talking about, right? This Dr. Hudson, hold up, hold <laughs> up, everybody. Hold up, everybody, because <laughs> everybody pay attention, and I'm going to clip what he's about to say for the Remix Morning Show because they have been giving me so much grief, brother. <laughs> Even my Pan-Africanists, one of my dearest Pan-Africanists said he becomes really... Uh, 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 what he's he 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 adheres to American exceptionalism when it comes to sports because okay. I keep trying to raise what's going on in Europe with European right. football, right? Not only because I love the game, but but right. I'm like, you got to see what's going on. This is U.S. capital trying to take yeah. over and turn their beautiful yes. leagues into yes. a monopolized, insulated exactly. Get them, Dr. Hudson, well, Pay attention, I mean everybody. <laughs> Look, I mean, what what we've seen, what we saw in Europe is is, and and it's, this is not to say that the you know European football, European soccer hasn't been completely corrupted by by soccer over the last twenty or thirty years. We we know that we know that um, the the major teams are owned by um, by oil magnates and dictatorships and all this kind of stuff. But this was a new plan that would 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 separate twelve of the kind of historic and strongest teams. In Europe to put them in this super league and and the, the super league of, of 12 teams that would really only play each other and other you know the and so other teams wouldn't be able to get into the mix but I, you know without going into the details of, I think it's important to say that that the English fans especially shut that down they attacked the owners they 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 said well you know what? we'll abandon this entire structure if you guys go uh, do, do with that and so that that the, the big year arsenal chelsea manchester united manchester city all these people had to step back and apologize to their fans which is something you would rarely see on this side with north american sports but i think what what's critical in this plan is that it was devised by uh fiorentino perez who's the the president of real madrid and a huge spanish industrial global industrialist but the money from this plan came from J.P. Morgan Chase right. on Wall Street. They were going to give half a billion dollars to each club to join this Super League and basically destroy the other leagues of Europe. So this, to me, I mean, we talk about concentration of wealth. We talk about banking power. And, you know, if I want to give a shout to um, 
to to uh, to my book Bankers and Empire, I spent a lot of time talking about uh, the history of J.P. Morgan from their origins in the slave trade. I talk, uh, spent a lot of time um, talking about the history of the the Chase Manhattan Bank, especially around their involvement in uh, bankrupting Cuba in the 1920s and 1930s. But these institutions still exist now. I mean, J.P. Morgan and Chase are more than 100 years old. And, and they're still involved in the same kind of financial skullduggery that they were doing in the 19th and, and early 20th century. And so the Super League is in some ways the highest stage of sports imperialism. Um, but what's important also is that people fought against it and they shut it down. You know, capitalists will always come back capitalizing, but uh, it's good to see that it shut down. I'm glad to know that that there's a, a, a soccer Listen, fan out there on Black Power Media. Oh, my goodness. And I've, I have been getting beaten up for it because I have to add this little bit for, for those who, who are not aware. The, the, one of the things that, that people don't in this country understand about European soccer is that is that they, they're set up as a pyramid. So the elite teams are supporting so many other lower clubs including now women's leagues and, and right. lower even women's divisions of soccer. Right. So there's a lot of people being supported. And what right. these elite teams, as you were pointing out, were trying to say is, especially with the pandemic, they were trying to say, we have suffered most of the losses. Right. So we, we want to now do following the, the North American model and JP Morgan and the Glazier owners, the Americans right. over right. here who own the Manchester, Manchester United. Right. They're trying to say, no, we want to do what they've done over here in the United States. Right. With the, with football and everything. Yeah. But by getting so so in, in Europe with soccer, there's people have to understand there's there's promotion and relegation. You can't just right. suck perennially yeah. right. and stay in the top leagues making all this money. If you keep losing, you get knocked to the lower divisions and you have to earn your way back up. Unlike here where people like me can grow up as an American football fan and my Washington football team can suck since 1992 and right. still make right. billions still make of dollars. Yeah be worth billions of dollars, never get relegated, still get first, you know, get top draft picks, still do and yeah. still suck after year after year after year. You can't do that over there without yeah. getting relegated. So there's this there's this incentive to be good and be competitive and actually care about your team. Absolutely. And the last point I, and the last point I want to just point out is that very quickly is that one of the reasons that, that this capital is going looking to go international into in European football is because those teams are much less expensive than teams here because here these are monopolized leagues that don't have to compete and they need all they, they can insulate themselves, guarantee money, guarantee your relative success financially, guarantee that they only have to compete against a handful of people. And I mean, it's such a fraudulent thing that, that and so what I was trying to tell my black power media comrades is this isn't a story about sports. This is European. This is this is international capital. This is Absolutely. this is anyway. So thank you, Doctor Hudson. I just want to <laughs> now. What everybody? <laughs> anyway, all right. Okay. I don't even know where, where we're going with all of this, but this, this is well because I, I started with the role of the banks, and I, right. I I I was not prepared for this. I didn't know I didn't know what your fandom where 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 it rests and all that. I didn't know about any of that. So, well, sometimes so, you have to keep it. You have to keep it secret because people will say that's not a real sport or you know all this kind of stuff, and it's like it's a beautiful game, man. It's a beautiful it's, game. Billions of people are into this game, man. And right, it's the right. most global. Anyway, whatever. And you gotta be there are no fat <laughs> people out there. You gotta be in shape, man. There's nobody you, you, gotta, run. Yeah. you gotta stay in shape. You gotta they run my these are the best athletes in the world. I'm not, I mean, anyway, I'm not any anyway, look, look, anyway. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's just so frustrating. Um anyway. The, but the reason I wanted this to get there, what, the reason why we started there is because I was I wanted you to talk a little bit about the role of banks. Uh, I'm, I'm 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 very glad you outlined at least for us what's in in your book for us to go, myself included, to go get get caught up to, um, uh, in terms of the role of banks uh, in, in in you know because even in in one of the um, that I pulled out here from your. Um, Anyway, just something to, to to talk from the piece of about your your um, uh, banking on empire book in the Boston Review was that you say here that that uh, for instance race was central to Citibank's work. This is was right. one of your uh, in its encounters with the nations and the colonies of the Caribbean and Latin America. Wall Street helped reorder the economies along racial lines, exporting the U.S. racist imaginaries in which Wall Street was embedded uh, and through which it functioned. So, but but listen to what you were just saying a moment ago. Um, so, 
because you talk about this in terms of racial capitalism. So are 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 you then also saying that your book attempts or does deploy, uh, I guess, method methodologically racial capitalism in the way that you were describing the South Africans were trying to do? Is that is that what you're trying to bring to to, to this discussion of banks and and uh, European empire? I, I think I think so, what what I'd say is that what I I tr I try to deploy racial capitalism in the way that many of the South Africans are doing it, but at that time I hadn't read what the South Africans are do were doing, so I wish I had kind of been able to to rethink it. But I, I will say this: that a, a couple of things here. One is one of the things that that kind of really messed me up when I was doing research on on uh, on the book is I was at at I think the New York Public Library, and I discovered that bankers created all these kind of internal journals and, and newsletters, right? So Citibank had one, uh, the, the, the Chase had one. They all, they all had these, these, these newsletters. And these newsletters were really important for my own research because it would give you a sense of like where the banks went, who the staff of the banks were, give you kind of sense of the internal cu uh, cultures of these institutions. Because I, I, mean, I don't know much, of, I didn't know much about banking. But one thing that struck me in these, these journals was it turns out that all of the major banks and probably all the banks in the United States in the 1920s and, and a little bit earlier would have minstrel shows where all of the players, all the, all the bank tellers and clerks would show up in blackface, you know, singing these jigaboo songs or, or whatever. And I remember coming across these things and, and being stunned. And I was like, so how is it that we're, you know, people don't want to talk about racism and finance, but I'm seeing this this very everyday basic quotidian deployment of racism in the banks. Even sometimes 55 Wall Street is now it's it's condos, but it's this this beautiful bank building um, in Lower Manhattan that was the home of the Citibank for for much of the 20th century. And they would they would have minstrel shows inside the bank itself, right? And I was like, this this is crazy. And so it, it, you know that. I was I was trying to figure out well is it just that they go out on uh, they go in blackface on the weekend that they make these racial comments you know in the evenings or is racism part of the integral practices of finance capitalism and I, I argue it is and I argue that it is in part because what I realize when these countries when 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 or excuse me when these banks when American banks are lending money to Caribbean countries and I'm probably African countries as well, South American countries. Part of their whole discourse is that black people, Caribbean people, African people don't deserve the low rates of interest because we don't know if they're financially, you know, astute. We don't know if they're going to be able to pay this money back. We don't know if they're going to have another revolution or if they're just going to be, you know, drinking their coconut water under a palm tree and not not working. And so, you know, we'll lend the money, but we're going to lend that money at, at 25 percent. And we're going to lend that money at 25 percent. We're also going to then take a 30 percent charge off the money. Um, and then on t uh, uh, in terms of w w when we lend them the money, they're going to have to give that money to American corporations and American sugar plantations doing business in the country. So at the end of the day, these countries are not getting any money for their loans. They're having to pay back these loans for, in, in perpetuity, but the, the basis of the loan itself is, is in a racist logic. And then we can even go further to say, well, um, in, in, in Cuba, uh, Citibank effectively created what was a slave trade of, of Haitian workers to uh, work in Cuban plantations. Um, they they replicated modes of Jim Crow segregation. So race then racism became a, a constitutive part of and is a constitutive part of of, of finance capitalism. Um, and I think that's again where where you know in the book I kind of toggle between finance capitalism and, and racial capitalism. But I would say that the the two are kind of working uh, in in concert. I would also say though that that what's important is we don't want to look at these either of these terms to say that they're eternal. Like racial capitalism mm -hmm. is not something that that um, has existed in one form through all time and will exist in one form through all time. And what was amazing to me is that during the Great Depression, you know, in the 1930s, when all these in 
financial institutions started to collapse and the, the global economy started to collapse, we also see that the kind of ideas of race started to shift here and that Caribbean people started who are in, in many cases who had embraced Europe for many years and who, who saw their kind of nationalist politics through European models turn to, to Africa. You see this kind of explosion of, of poetry and, and writing and a kind of early black consciousness movement uh, in, in the 1920s and 1930s that I think is a response to racial capitalism. It's, it was about black people reclaiming blackness in, in the Caribbean as a kind of antidote, as Alejo Carpentier, the Cuban writer said, to Wall Street uh, practices. Mm. Wow, listen, wow, okay. Yeah, I can't wait. I gotta get. I gotta get to this book. Um, listen, we're coming up on an hour, so I usually I just want to do a time check with you uh, to make to see where you are and to make sure if there's something that you wanted to make sure you conveyed in this discussion that I didn't invite that you you get a chance to lay it out. Um, uh, I'm, I was quickly scrolling through the comments and chats, and I don't want to get out of. Yeah, taking I, I, out too I, many rabbit holes, but the, but you know, I, I I was going through the the the, the chat, and it seems to be a lot of people attacking you over uh, over whether football is a sport and whether Maradona was got fat and this, this kind of stuff. So I don't know if we want to we want to pursue that, but I think you know I think um you know I hope this can be the beginning of a of a longer conversation. I think there's a lot of things to to be said here. Um, I oh, absolutely. Yeah, let me let me leave it at that because this this has been this has been wonderful, and uh, I hope maybe you know post pandemic we can watch some football together. Oh, no doubt, man. And uh, listen, first of all, you don't even know how many emails you're gonna get from me going forward today after the whole football thing. You're gonna you're gonna, and I will catch up to your work, but you're gonna you're gonna. <laughs> there's probably gonna be a moment for you where you're like, man, I need this brother to leave me leave me be a little bit because. Uh, but first of all, real quick, um, do you have a team? Do you have a club that you follow from over here? I, I, I am an I'm an Arsenal supporter, though though they've really broken my heart over the last last decade or so. But uh, I'm an Arsenal fan. All right, right on. I haven't picked one yet. I've been just I've been you know my daughter wants me to. I'm basically a Liverpool fan by by okay. default through my yeah. youngest. But but and also because I read somewhere that they have a, like a working class background as a, as a club. But but oh, yeah, a lot of these yeah. You know, a lot of these clubs do Manchester United, Liverpool, Arsenal as, as well. But I, you know, again, now it's just the, the way that money's come in and just kind of, you know, nested up for for supporters. But uh, that's yeah. Walmart capital got Arsenal that's now. It. I mean, that's that's oh, it's man. terrible. Like it's it's, it's so anyway. We, yeah, I, yeah, we'll it's, talk about that. <laughs> and and it's Barclays, as people have pointed out, that owns the Premier League. So I mean, there's right. all you talk about the right. banking. It's all kinds of and, and you know anyway, but. But right. Dr. Peter James Hudson, I really appreciate you coming through. Uh, uh, I can't wait for more. And, um, and we're only 90 minutes away from people being able to see the Steph Curry of football, Kylian Mbappe in the, in the Champions League against oh, yeah. uh, um, a, a Man City. So, so if people want to see the real best yeah. player in the world, 3 p.m. Eastern time, you can go check it out. But anyway, Dr. Hudson, thank you very much, man. I appreciate this. I had a good time with this. I appreciate you. Thanks for the invitation. I'll talk anytime more to soon, more soon for sure. All right. Take care. Take care for sure. Yes, indeed. All right, everybody. Uh, listen again, big shout out to Dr. Hudson. Appreciate him. I do want to take some time. If, uh, if you all can stick around and go, get to some of the stories I didn't get to earlier. Um, uh, but I am going to, first of all, let's, let's, let's get on team Randall here and hit the like button. And uh, the 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 share and subscribe and all that good stuff. I see some comments that I want to uh, get to in just a second. Uh, uh, the football hate in, in in here is just terrible. Um, but listen, I need to take a quick break. We're going to come back. Got got a whole bunch of other stories that I wanted to get to, uh, and some other things to come back to before we wrap up today. Um, and and uh, plus, I got ninety minutes before the real best player in the world hits the field. So anyway, hold tight for just a second. If you would, I'll be back in just a quick second. Get yourself a bio break and a drink. Hit the like button, the share, subscribe, all that good stuff. Uh, several more important stories to cover here real quick. And I mix what I like live here at Black Power Media. So don't go anywhere. We will be right back.
All right, good folks. Appreciate you uh, sticking around. Those who have, uh, those who are seeing this later in the replay, uh, welcome to you as well. Uh, please make sure you've signed up everywhere, blackpowermedia.org, the Patreon and all of that. And again, I just want to uh, reiterate one of the reasons why we're asking you. One, we have a drive to get uh, to 175 uh, patron patrons. Uh, but also that th this is part of the context. Um, from earlier this, uh, this month, YouTube CEO, it's easy to make up content and post from your basement. So we boost authoritative sources. So again, this is that old thing about people in, in the, uh, and, and I'll credit him for this. You know, I saw, uh, um, not the story initially, but, but, but some of Jimmy Dore's discussion of this. Um, and I do, I do watch the show, uh, where you just see all the contradictions of the white left at play. So they'll only talk about Assange and not Mumia, uh, you know, his black guests are, you know, liberal, new liberal football players, uh, occasionally Cornell West, maybe, um, and his only guest from Black Agenda Report is the very non-black Danny Haifong, who does good work, but I just find it very interesting that he is the lone representative of Black Agenda Report on all of these other platforms. Anyway, but Jimmy Jimmy Dore makes this good point that that they they revisit the old trope of the 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 basement to suggest that people who are who are doing what YouTube was supposed to have been made for that YouTube that you all, we all tube uh, is just people in their basement. So, so they're, they're not authoritative, authoritative. But of course, who are the authoritative sources that they want us to, to be reading and paying attention to? Well, they're all the same people that have been lying about everything from Russia gate to weapons of mass destruction to uh, you, you know, I mean, name it, uh, to where a democracy to, to whatever. Um, so, so she's talking about that we, we need to, we need to, 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 uh, th that is YouTube needs to support high quality journalistic reporting. Um, so they're going to throttle, uh, so that's not an easy trade-off. I mean, your name is YouTube. The whole principle is that you, anyone can have complete free speech and publish whatever they want. Or that was the founding principle. I would imagine that this is a trade-off that did not come lightly. But Bojicki tried to defend the policy by claiming that YouTube's early videos were mostly entertainment uh, and, and the platform still wants to enable new artists to break out, but there needs to be different approach or, or for sensitive content. This isn't the first time YouTube executive has used a basement analogy to suggest that independent creators coverage of the news is low quality. They're just espousing their opinions. But but if you turn on commercial media, this is exactly what they all do. So, for instance, last month, mainstream media outlets admitted that their previous reports claiming that then President Trump had had told the chief investigator at the Georgia Secretary of State's office to find the fraud were false. Another example of fake news from mainstream media outlet that particularly relevant in light of these basement analogies is CNN's Chris Cuomo staging his exit from self-isolation in his basement after admitting he left the house a week earlier. Anyway, and those are just some of the silly ones. So, for instance, just in, in talking about what we were we we were discussing earlier, uh, um, where's the mainstream cover? We heard Pam Africa saying, "Where's the mainstream coverage of what has happened to Move, or what's happening with Mumia, or what's happening with the 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 bones of of their murdered family?" 
So, I, I, you know, again, so so the point I'm trying to make here very quickly, at least, is that one of the reasons why I think we're asking for more support through Patreon, trying to hit the goal of 175 patrons, why we want more people to, yes, join the channel and support us here, but also uh, um, uh, through blackpowermedia.org is because if YouTube continues to throttle and punish people for, for telling the truth, and as we continue to expand here at Black Power Media, and have our revenue do more of the kind of work I'm going to show you some of in just a moment that others are doing that I would like to see more to see more of us doing, then we're also going to get, you know, further algorithmed away from uh, being seen. So it, it is true that when uh, when you hit the like button and the subscribe button, it actually does algorithmically maneuver videos into more positions of prominence. Uh, uh, and if you sign up through the website or through Patreon, uh, that is through black, blackpowermedia.org or through Patreon, then if we ever find ourselves in a situation where, as is happening elsewhere, uh, subscribers are being removed, chan you know, channels being removed, videos being blocked, um, demonetized, etc., then we would still be able to reach all of you, and then maybe still be able to continue our work on another platform. Uh, so, um, anyway, that's that's just anyway. At least one of the the points to make there. Uh, another thing I wanted to 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 shout out very quickly is uh, last night's another great edition of Sundays with the Ear Doctor. Uh, please make sure you're checking those out. Uh, that uh, uh, it's just an hour, eight to nine p.m. Eastern. And, but the ear doctor, I mean, you know, I don't, you know, I know, you know, he does. He come, you know, he's on the remix morning show. He's on Renegade Culture. He's doing the producing and the editing, and he comes, you know, does some comedic, you know, spots and whatever. But I, so I don't know if people are not aware of just how dope a DJ he actually is. Uh, so don't let the comedy or the or the 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 sidekick role that he plays elsewhere fool you. The, the man knows what he's doing musically, and he did a conscious hip hop hour last night that was off the hook. Uh, so so anyway, like I, I admit, the first time I actually saw him spin like for real, for real, a few months ago, I was blown away. And he continues every week to show and prove. So please come out for Sundays. Uh, right here at Black Power Media, 8 to 9 p.m. Eastern. Uh, we covered some of the points I was going to make about football. I did have that as a point I wanted to break. I did not know Dr. Hudson was going to do it. So we 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 kind of covered that there. Um, so I'm going to leave that there for now. But 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 definitely check into that because, <laughs> yeah. Um, so so similarly, we've already uh, also the other story I was going to cover today uh, that before I knew the, about the press conference that started at 11 a.m. this morning from the move uh, movement move organization um, uh, was going to talk about, you know, that story. Um, we'll probably come back to that at another time. But we, we since we covered some of the press conference and we heard from Pam and the, the move members themselves, uh, they, they got the word out. We put the link to that press conference in the description to this video, and we'll continue to share it as well. And we remind you also that that uh, it was on our remix morning show last week that Pam Africa, uh, you know, broke the news. You know, that was broke the news beyond um, the initial story that had just come out that they had just learned about. She came here. Uh, to, to the Remix Morning Show, which is 8, 8 a.m. to 10 a.m. Eastern, Tuesday, Wednesdays, and Thursdays every week. Uh, soon to get to five days a week, I'm pretty sure. But uh, for now, Tuesdays, Wednesdays, and Thursdays. And she was right there to, 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 to jump on with us to, to tell us about that the other day. So, um, yeah. Uh, I did also, during during my muted mic at the beginning, I was trying to shout out my my black power media comrades that i saw at the philly rally saturday uh black alliance for peace was out there pan african community action was out there uh many other folks were out there in philly uh, and it was a great day personally for me and my my oldest daughter to get to to she got to meet pam africa which was dope uh and she did also 
not to disrespect meeting anybody else, but but Pam, you know, got uh, got we go a little bit way back, um, not in her inner circle, so to speak, but I've been you know working with her on and off for a long time. So it was great for my my daughter to get to finally meet her in person. Uh, she had been present actually at another rally years ago, but was was too young, and you know we didn't get actually to, to meet her. wouldn't Wouldn't have meant anything, but today, but yesterday or Saturday rather, did mean something. Um, but she also of course got to meet Dr. CBS and 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 Ricky Ryan and the Luke Mons and and several other good people. And shout out to those who are uh, who check out the channel who uh, came up to us. We appreciate that. Shout out to Omawale Africa. Saw him up there. A number of a number of folks that 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 you know uh, didn't get to see Dr. Strong, but I but I know that she was up there, Crystal Strong. So anyway. Uh, that was great. But one thing I did want to, to do uh, to talk about a little bit today before I before I dip out uh, is that April 25th was also the seventh anniversary of the Flint, Michigan water crisis that and when we're talking about commercial media not covering a lot of things, that was one thing that was not covered. And I want to just be straight up about this is another one of the the sort of, I guess, white left media alternative media channels I check out a lot is status quo. Um, and straight up, I want Black Power Media to be doing, in our context, a lot of the work that they're doing. Uh, so again, when I'm talking about the the, the Patreon piece um, and the support for the channel piece, uh, so for instance, I noted here that in the vi- some of the video that that, that I'm going to show you from them in just a minute, because uh, they've been doing a lot of the, the the real grassroots coverage of the Flint crisis that no one else is covering. Um, including the fact that nothing is fixed, the, the water is not clean. Uh, I mean, you know, nothing's been dealt with. Uh, uh, and and this, this dude, uh, 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 um, uh, uh, <laughs> shout out to Roberto. Um, you know that you know this governor is is a criminal. That Obama, I think. You know, behaved uh, uh, um, uh, yeah. Apologies for that. He's getting at it. Um, you know, Obama had to ha- he has to be seen as behaving uh, with with certain levels of criminality as well. Going in there, drinking the water. Uh, you know, knowing what you know all, uh, behind the scenes. Uh, anyway, but my point is, is that Status Quo has well over eighteen hundred members of their YouTube channel, which. Um, uh, and I take them at their word and their work seems to support this. They use the revenue from that almost exclusively to sustain themselves and to be out in the field doing a lot of the kind of journalism I would like to see BPM doing again in our context, but covering the kind of stories like this that no one else is covering, but also in a way that no one else would cover it. Uh, um, we are, I think we're we're just short of 200 YouTube channel members and just short of 175 Patreon uh, supporters. So, uh, uh, and frankly, we would have to be, you know, rivaling, you know, the 1800 plus number of members to, to really be doing the kind of work that they're doing. Um, uh, uh, not that we don't, really appreciate the ones we have, but, but to, to, to do that kind of work, we would have to, you know, have that many more, um, so that you know that there is this, uh, um, sustainable revenue that can, you know, be used to send people places to get the videography equipment, to get the editing that we need and all that kind of stuff. Um, uh, anyway, so, so that would, that would, that's at least one of the reasons why I keep wanting to come back to, to, uh, membership and all that kind of stuff. But I'm gonna. I want to just pull up this this uh, their own montage again. This is from Status Quo uh, that they've put together to show the seven years of coverage that they've been engaged in on this crisis. That I think is uh, uh, really important. That isn't getting enough coverage, uh, even within you know nominally black media. Even as you see, well, we'll see where it. You'll see where it ends. Um, uh, We'll come back and, exp- you know, I think, well, if it's not self-evident, I think it'll also be, we can also come back and make clear why and what those differences are. But again, uh, um, shout out to Status Quo. Um, 
this is just a, a few minutes of uh, of a, in, in a mon- of a montage that they put together uh, to talk about the work that they've been doing in in covering this this crisis over the last seven years. So let's check this out. The city now is sending all these uh, shutoff notices for um, people's water, uh, saying you have, I mean, maybe a week to pay your bill, uh, or you, have, you know, you're evicted. Well, it's diabolical because we've never once stopped being charged for water, toxic water that we cannot use, toxic water that has corroded um, the pipes in people's homes. Anybody that can withstand the forces that have been up against these people over the past three years and still be standing, they deserve an award. So uh, this one we've seen, it's basically like white splotches. Can we see this one again? After we got out the tub, her hands were still wet and she rubbed her face. Her face had actually wet the and then it just left that mark. So like, that was from the hand. Uh, that stuff that was right here, stuff right here, mm-hmm. was all over her face. I found out I was pregnant in 2015, and I started having complications from the day that I found out that I was pregnant. Um, I stayed going back and forth to the emergency room, stayed with complications, and. So I thought the second baby would be my miracle baby and that baby would make it. But two months and a week into my second trimester, I ended up losing the second baby. I actually, at home, I've got a piece of a drain trap and the bottom is completely rotten out of it. And that's a seven old seven-year-old piece of pipe and it shouldn't have corroded like that but it did due to the fact that our water wasn't properly treated with anti-corrosion control uh, it will be my 10th time to flint michigan to cover the ongoing water uh, crisis again it is a crisis weeks ago the state announced it would end bottled water distribution because the city's water is safe to drink but the county health department is saying not so fast The Genesee County Health Department is warning residents to keep using filters and bottled water. So I will be back in Flint, Michigan uh, at the beginning of the week. You know, I put my everything into this story. It's probably the most important um, story that I've ever done. You're not supposed to run your water before you test. When you run the water for several minutes before you test, that that, um, basically eliminates most of the lead and you get a lower lead reading because you've run the water. Shades around his eyes are burning, cigar in his mouth. When the water crisis is over and somebody stands up and says, hey, the water crisis is over, will anybody believe it? No. 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 Uh, I know you can play games with whether or not you allow water to run before you test it or how long you let it run, things like that. I don't trust the city of Flint, the governor, any of them. I'm all broke out. I'm all broke out. I have I have picked my own pictures. I'm all broke out. I'm diabetic. I have, look at, I have like whips. And I, this is from the water. It's just breaking out stuff like that. My teeth. So the residents here are discouraged. Here we could have gotten a major decision in the Flint water crisis and uh, and the death. What's going on? What do you think is happening here? Well, I don't think it's right that we have to, after all of this went down, that we have to pay a water bill. And, you know, it's not our responsibility. And, uh... We know where the fault lies. It's for, to me, it's with the mayor and the governor. So, all if that's what's going on in the city, and y'all is finding this out, I would like to know more about it myself. Speak on justice for Flint, because all of the charges have been dropped. We're up against the statute of limitations. Go for it. So, 
what's fun is that when you have a governor and an attorney general who campaign on justice for Flint, promise to open the water pod so we can have people have access to clean, safe water because it's not that way yet. And it won't be until all the pipes are replaced. Um, then to turn around after you get elected, you know, to stand next to us and use us and text us and talk to us and ask for our help and ask for us to stand with you. Then to turn around, no longer speak to you and then say no more funding for Flint. Uh, folks, I don't want to declare it too soon, but ladies and gentlemen, we got them. Now, the good news is I have a massive, massive story of corruption. Were there other things that you discovered in the course of uh, all of these interviews? I want uh, Flint residents listening. Uh, to imagine mission accomplished, George W. Bush, you know, landing in his fighter pilot with his commando suit and declaring, you know, we've won. So basically what's happened here is the lines were, this is what you found for talking to residents, that the lines were being flushed before the tests were being conducted. If you're testing for lead and copper and you're trying to meet EPA regulations, you have to totally not use your water for at least six hours. This is incredible. So you you initially broke the, this piece in, uh, in Vice, um, and then you also had a second uh, piece in Detroit uh, Metro Times. And I also think that a lot of times people see like Flint in a headline, and it's not that they don't care, but they don't realize that what happened in Flint is similar things are happening all over the country. Uh, so it's definitely a national story. Sentinel samples themselves, status quo repeatedly asked the EPA if the agency had been aware of state officials were improperly entering, entering homes of residents on a cinema program and collecting samples. The agency didn't respond. Yeah, six and a half years. Jesus. Actually tweeted today, six and a half years, they don't have clean water. Nobody has been sent to prison. Nobody's even faced a jury trial. Um, it is completely unfathomable. We had disagreed with that decision that made it very clear that the water should be provided until the entire system is completely repaired. And there should be absolute integrity in the testing. I mean, I, I guess I take issue uh, with your, your point about nobody ever speaking up about it. You haven't, sir. I mean, you, you haven't publicly said anything. This has been in your office since November. I don't, I don't think that's the case. I appreciate you. What, what, when did you? What do you mean? I've been going back and forth with your office. They, they say you had reached out to MDEQ about it, but you haven't publicly said anything. Uh, you know, and Snyder's charges are a lot more tame uh, than they should be. I mean, they're just getting him for willful no neglect. Jordan, break down the latest charges. Um, as I understand it, these are not like the full accounting of justice that still needs to be done and put it in the context of the full investigation regarding the fund. Yeah, so for those that don't know, there's actually two separate investigations. One was started in 2016 by a special prosecutor, kind of like the Robert Mueller, I guess, of Flint. Um, that was an outside independent counsel. His team uh, went to 2019. And then two, in 2019, current Attorney General Dana Nessel uh, dismissed, fired that whole team and started the investigation new. Uh, and we found what they found, which was uh, an avalanche of phone calls between Governor Snyder, his chief of staff, as well as his health director, yeah, it's pretty impressive that basically it sounds like he forgot to send in, like, um, put a cover sheet on his TPS report. It was, uh, I was saying, like, when you and I talked the other day, um, that I was, you know, I, I couldn't let myself get excited because of the fact that I knew that it would most likely be something like jaywalking tickets. Uh, I actually, somebody had told me that um, speeding fines are actually more than what he's getting levied. And um, that basically it was going to be a, well, I went from saying a slap on the wrist to a tap because a slap would actually stink. So um, I read both of the stories. You just broke two articles, basically. And the way that 
I read all of this was it felt like a mafia movie. Like you see genuine, like organized crime. You see payoffs. You know, um, this is really uh, it's not necessarily anything that's surprising, but the revelations nonetheless are still really shocking. I mean, to me, it was clear that Rick Snyder was a criminal. He was criminally neg negligent, you know, at a minimum. But now it's clear that this goes really deeper than that. Um, just to go over a couple of the facts here, and we'll link to the articles down below. So he tried to get the mayor of Flint, Michigan, Karen Weaver, to quote unquote have uh, uh, Elijah Cummins back off. It, from a legal standpoint, can anything be done with the information that was gathered during the initial investigation? I mean, well, first of all, I think it's important to say, I know for a fact um, that the current investigation that charged the governor with a misdemeanor has all of the information I reported. So they have it. They know about these phone calls. These phone calls were basically a smoking gun. I mean, they're not on the phone, bang, 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 for two days talking about the weather. Does that make the state liable? What does it I mean? What could, like, you know, you know uh, based upon this reporting, what could happen? Yeah, so we, fa we found evidence that previous prosecutors, they've been fired since by the current attorney general, were building a case against Snyder. They actually secretly uh, brought in his chief of staff for uh, a confidential subpoena. He, they brought in his treasurer for a confidential interview. They brought in his top advisor, uh, Richard Baird, who was known kind of as Snyder's right-hand man. They've convinced, I think, a lot of pe people who are maybe listening to us right now are going, why are you guys talking about this? I thought, I mean, I get why, okay, yeah, the governor, you know, was arraigned, arrested, you know, this week. But, but, but hey, it's, it got fixed a couple of years ago. That's not the case, is it, Jordan? They literally cooked the data for, yeah. from 2016 to 20, at least 2018. Governor Whitmer, when she came in, she actually acknowledged that the testing was done wrong. So, frankly, I mean, I don't want to give any, uh, you know, fear to anyone, but I don't think there's any declarative way to declare this water safe today because the testing was compromised. Erin Brockovich, she saw what I had and she called it a crime. She said the testing needs to be invalidated and redone by an independent agency. Uh, that was never done. So this is still, uh, you know, I, I think people have become numb to the term crisis. This is still a disaster. I mean, it, we got COVID, everybody is suffering right now, but in Flint, they got a double disaster because not only older ages are, are compromised uh, to the coronavirus. All ages are compromised. Jordan, thank you so much for your reporting all these years for your latest piece here on Flint, which I will have a link right here on the podcast page. Please read it and read his other work. It's, it's so important. Uh, yeah, I would have to agree with uh, Michael Moore on that one. Uh, I think uh, status quo's work is important. <clears throat> By the way, if, if you are, for those who don't know, <clears throat> excuse me, it was it was their videographer that got the uh, all a bulk of the original footage from the January sixth event that all the major media outlets used uh, over and over and over again, but which status quo was uh, cited uh, by YouTube and that footage removed. So the original raw video of the, whatever you want to describe the, the, the events of January 6th as came from them uh, and it was removed from their site. And meanwhile, all the corporate media outlets that use that video uh, to make their money and drive up their ad revenue, uh, you know, were able to continue to use it uh, endlessly. So, yeah, they do good work. And I and I and I did want to just mention uh, here that again that uh, um, uh, while we're not able to to do that on, kind of on the ground reporting yet here at BPM, the the um, at least part of the analysis, uh, whether it be through racial capitalism or uh, internal colonialism or uh, simply the, the need not to continue to go back to the same Democratic Party forces that end up supporting all of this. Uh, uh, Rick Snyder, you know, may be whatever, but it was Obama and and still to this day with Biden, uh, their administrations that haven't um, uh taking care of the issue to this day. So people can blame Trump all they want, but Obama's the one that went there and pretended to drink the water in front of uh, the, what is what uh, Jordan and they report is 53%, still 53% black uh, Flint, Michigan, uh, and almost all 
you know, lower, lower to, you know, working class, uh, poor families. So, um, you know, Obama sold everybody out uh, to the extent that he had ever been, you know, bought in or whatever. He was really you know, just doing what he was always ever doing. Um, but anyway, my point is, you know, uh, unlike uh, Michael Moore, unlike Roland Martin, unlike even uh, Jordan from Status Quo, who supported Biden, uh, we have a very different argument here or set of arguments here uh, in terms of electoral politics that I think uh, uh importantly offers up some differences. And then we also have different traditions of politics in terms of what uh, communities could be encouraged to do organizationally uh, as a response to this that you're not going to hear from them uh, or other outlets. So, uh, but but uh, nonetheless, I, I, you know, I'm a supporter of Status Quo and I, uh, you know, appreciate their work and uh, um, particularly on this issue. Uh, when very few to no one else uh, would do that. Um, by the way, the only other thing I forgot to mention to Dr. Hudson about the football crisis, uh, the football issue, just quickly, is that we do disagree. And I, this is something I should have mentioned. I, was, I got carried away in the excitement. As I said earlier, I don't agree that the Super League was or, or foreign capital was thwarted by organized labor's protests. Yes, the fans of the clubs made it a loud problem that they didn't want this. And they showed up in numbers and protested outside of club. But it was the fact that other elite, monstrously elite entities were also in support of an end to that Super League, namely FIFA and the uh, UEFA, European Soccer, uh, European Football Association. Uh, so it's not quite the David and Goliath story again that is that is is it's sometimes encouraged. It is it is you know one Goliath against another Goliath, and we'll see how it ends up in the future. But uh, anyway, that was just one one quick point I wanted to make about that. Um, uh, and and really that's it. That was it for me. Uh, uh, we'll we'll see about getting back in touch with Brother Amanla about his new book on Kwame and Krumah. Uh, and definitely try to catch up with more of Dr. Hudson's work as well. Uh, and uh, uh, by the way, I just, while we were airing that video from Status Quo, um, uh, I will happily name drop and say that I got a call from Pam Africa uh, to make sure that that that, um, that we had seen the, the live stream and that she wanted to remind me as I'll remind you. Uh, and well, first I'll let you know, she's not able to, to join us live herself because she's just understandably... Uh, wiped out for the moment. Uh, the the you know putting together a press conference, speaking at a press conference, never mind dealing with the emotions of of the uh, of the day in the reporting. Um, she's wiped out, but she wanted to reiterate, and I, I said I would reiterate in her on her behalf that as they said during the press conference, their demands uh, in response to this issue of the uh, state of Pennsylvania. Uh, co-opting and and stealing uh, the bones of her murdered family members. Uh, the demand in response to that is free Mumia. That's it, as they made very clear during the press conference. Uh, and I'm being very clear also in saying I am not speaking on behalf of MOVE. They, As they said, only MOVE speak on behalf of MOVE. I'm simply relaying a message, as I promised I would, from Pam Africa just a minute ago, and just re simply restating what they said very clearly on the, the press conference today. They can't be made whole. The, there's no way for the state to return their loved ones, including their animals, and the life that was taken. The only thing that they want at this point is for me, for Mumia to be released immediately, not a new trial, not just a new, you know, incarcerated location or an improved whatever release immediately so that he can get whatever medical treatment he, he, he can still get and, and live out what life he has left in whatever relative state of freedom he can get. So that's it. So on a move. Shout out to Pam and the rest of the MOVE movement and, of course, Free Mumia and all political prisoners. Uh, thanks to everybody for joining me and us this, this afternoon. Uh, thanks to uh, Dr. Peter Hudson for that great conversation and for his support 
of my support of international football. Anyway, uh, don't forget tomorrow morning, 8 a.m. Eastern, the Remix Morning Show. Uh, surprises galore coming this week. Uh, a bunch of great programming, all the great shows. Uh, please check out the channel, like, share, subscribe, join if you can, blackpowermedia.org, sign up there as well, Patreon if you can as well, all that good stuff. And if you got more to say that I didn't get to, or if you see this in the replay later, like my man Pierre at Comedy Hype, put it in the comments. By the way, speaking of Roland Martin real quick, I was going to do a piece. I was thinking about doing a piece on this, but but um, I go back and forth about how much time I want to take paying attention to what they're saying. Did you all see Comedy Hype did a great interview about this? There's that conservative young brother in Georgia that was talking about do for self that 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 Roland Martin called an idiot. I don't agree with either one of them, just to be clear. But the idea that Roland Martin would, first of all, call a young man an idiot. Simply for disagreeing with him on the issue of government support for black causes. I think says a lot about not just Roland Martin, but the state of the kind of journalism and commercial broadcasting that is being directed at black audiences on a regular basis. For Roland Martin to pride himself on the position he holds in black media, for him to take that position against someone within his community, within the black community, who is simply, and again, I don't agree with the brother either, but but to, to, to call him an idiot beyond my my petty jokes for Roland and all of that says a lot about the media environment we're dealing with and the politics of it. Uh, and this was connected to another piece where I was, it was brought to my attention recently, a video about the trillionaire Academy of Jay Morrison, who was teamed up with, uh, um, Oh, what's my man? The, 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 uh, uh, uh Bryant, Reverend Bryant, uh, um, What's his name? Somebody help me out in the comments uh, from Baltimore who went down south and set up his his hustle down there once he got ran out of Baltimore. Um, that prosperity preacher who during the uprising after the killing <clears throat> of Freddie Gray, one of my arguments was that the ignoble leadership that pre-existed the killing of Freddie Gray was using the kill killing of Freddie Gray to reinscribe itself as legitimate. Uh, and Bryant was one of them, uh, Jamal Bryant. Thank you. And if anybody, those of you in Baltimore know what's up better than I do. But if anybody, never mind what's been said publicly or just shown in his political work publicly, holler at some of those journalists in Baltimore. See what they have to say that they can't get enough to go on the record with. It's it's not a surprise he's not there anymore and has set up shop in Georgia with this dude Jay Morrison and this trillionaire academy nonsense. And to have seen him sitting on Roland Martin previously uh, talking about the state of the black church and all this other stuff with concern in their eyes as they go about parading this false economic analysis uh, where Jay Morrison literally in a recent video this this month stands there and talks about how he started from nothing, made a whole bunch of money, lost all that money, and then got that money back. And now he's going to teach you how to create generational wealth using a method that he claims will create generational wealth, but has only allowed him to, to earn, lose, earn, lose, earn again. That alone But he wants to sell a 72 session program to teach people how to become financially literate and to close, as he says, the racial wealth gap in this society. Shameful. And I think that there's a, a, a connection between the approach of calling this young man an idiot and supporting this kind of non 
non non analysis and and hustle hu- hustlerism. Similarly, somebody tagged me recently. Two things happened today. Somebody tagged me on something with this 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 apparently youngish sister plagiarized my work and then got mad at me for pointing out that it was plagiarized and suggested that I was doing it just to get more anyway to get more people to to download my free book. <laughs> I was like, you just plagiarized the work. It was pretty clear. Um, but somebody else tagged me in something recently the other day saying, and and, and Dr. Boyce Watkins saying that he, that we should platform together in some way and that these two doctors and scholars should, you know, uh, meet to discuss. Uh, and even with all due respect to my own kin, who 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 have have some affinity for this dude? I, I I know how it sounds when I say it, but the reality is you can't it can't happen like that. First of all, I don't think what he does is scholarship. People can can I don't think I'm the number one scholar either. People can debate that, but what he is doing is not scholarship. And as I said, he is selling people myths, and I am giving away the myth busting for free. So th- there is no. We are just two scholars and brothers trying to, as Amiri Baraka once said in a different context, but I quote it all the time, both the slave and the slave master cannot be right. Someone who sells you, like Jay Morrison and Boyce Watkins do, sells you programs that you have to pay for to learn how to become financially literate, which has nothing to do with collective inequality. That alone, from in, 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 in whether the publisher had done, I'm glad the publisher did that. That gave away my decided my book could be given away for free, because uh, um, that I would prefer be that way. I'd rather make no money. I wasn't going to make money anyway, but I was. I'm I'm happy to have people get the book for free, uh, so that that at least be confronted with my certainly relative to those I'm just com- being compared to s- scholarly approach at explaining that this is a myth. Then, and, you know, so in other words, there have to be moments where people just say, look, we're not here to build together because somebody is doing something that if they're not conscious of, of, of the fraudulence in it, if they're not conscious of the, the misleading that they're involved in, then, then, then they need to be made aware of that before there can be any sort of collegial exchange uh, um, and I'm thinking, and I'm suggesting that they know that they're involved in a hustle, and that's why they continue to 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 sell this 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 mythology, literally sell a myth of financial literacy through their their 72 courses, as as Jay Morrison said. Um, uh, and I did try to watch the video I was sent to see as much of it as I could, and it's the same essential claim that that we're poor because we're not making our money work we're not making our debt work we're not doing what 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 others are doing without explaining how what others are doing are things we cannot do uh and it also suggests also just the the baseline that within a capitalist economy there can be a closing of the gap you cannot do that it is it is functionally impossible within a capitalist economy to close the gap between rich and poor because the point of capitalism is to extract from the poor wealth for a tiny ever decreasing number of people. So you can't have the joke I used to make, you cannot have um, uh, 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 you cannot have a VIP in the club unless you put the rope there and create a, a situation where everybody else is in the rest of the club. You cannot have a first class on a plane without having coach. Otherwise everybody's just on the plane and then you're some that's that's communism. Capitalists don't want that. So this idea, and, and there has to be a point where they these these men in this position, in this case, know that they're selling this lie. So no, I don't want to be in, a, in an exchange with them. Uh, 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 in in uh, anyway, it, anyway. So I just would put that out. Anyway, um, the website wants to charge. Baltimore. The website wants to charge us as black people four hundred where you save a thousand dollars from the original cost of real estate. Uh, wow. Okay. Is that is that Boyce's website? Doc Boyce has good points. No, he doesn't. Not when it comes to an economic analysis. He absolutely does not. I'm sorry. 
He's just factually incorrect all the time. In fact, his his argument in support of buying power was the first one I called out in my first commentary on the issue more than 10 years ago. Um, it's, it's uh, um, yeah, so... Anyway, I, I I I was throwing all that in in a quick circle just because it was there was all this coming together of the of Roland Martin, Jay Morrison, and Boyce Watkins in in the last uh, couple of days. But um, uh, I mean, he claims he's doing an economic analysis because his argument is black people are poor because black people are not financially literate. <laughs> so so it's the same thing with Jay Morrison. Their argument is if we um, uh, um again invest better save better uh buy their courses i mean that's an economic analysis to tell somebody if you pay me for my my classes on economics you will be better and at one point years ago boyce was claiming all kinds of stuff about i'm going to you're going to make promises about how much money he was going to make for people that 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 it's 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 disgusting is what it is. It's disgusting. It's not even just factually incorrect. It's really infuriating when you're going when you're going to your own impoverished, oppressed community and telling them that you can get them out of the problem when you know factually that that's not correct because that's why you're selling this program. Otherwise, you would just sit on top of all your riches and tell people for free how to do it. Why then sell it? Because you've already made, you're already claiming, Jay Morrison, Watkins, you're already claiming to have done what you're going to teach us to do. So why don't you just sit on that wealth? Why then charge us for it? What do you need to charge us for? 72 classes at that. So, I mean, it's, 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 it, 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 I mean, yeah, I mean, I don't know what else you would call it. I don't want to, you know, whatever, but he did, that was it. He said he was going to make millionaires without, that's right. He was going to make us all million. I mean, (laughs) anyway, check the video we just did with um, NCRC about black business. Check the link to that business, that report as well. I'd love to see them to actually, that's what I would like to see that I would like to see Jay Morrison or you can send me the link to that. That's a video I'll watch when they read my book or the, the report on black businesses that uh, Dedrick Muhammad and NCRC led in putting out that we did an interview about the other day, send me the video where they're breaking that down and how all of that's wrong. That I would like to see that. Or the video that we did with, with um, again, not the non-revolutionary, just the, the good brother, Derek Hamilton. That Go look at that discussion. Where, where are we wrong? The sister that plagiarized my work who says she doesn't want to read it. I, you know, read it and then tell me where I was wrong. <laughs> <laughs> read it and then say where we were wrong. I, I, I'm still waiting for that review or that comment, that commentary. I, I'm I, I'm open to the possibility. <laughs> All right. Anyway, again, thanks to, again, everybody. Please do sign up. There's a lot more coming on this channel. Uh, a, a lot of great stuff coming starting tomorrow morning at 8 a.m. In fact, I'm not even sure if somebody hasn't set up to do something later today. But as far as I know, the next thing is tomorrow morning. A lot of great stuff coming. The Black Myths podcast started last week. So please catch that if you haven't already about China as a colonizer in Africa. That's the myth they challenge um, uh, in their first drop. Uh, all of the remix shows from last week uh, are, are, are worth a review if you missed any of them. Uh, and they start up again tomorrow morning. All of the dope Fridays from last week, uh, you know, check that as well. Even got a few minutes of the Mumia rally from Saturday up there as well. So anyway, a lot of stuff at BPM. Please check it out and share it, subscribe to it. And uh, I'll catch you uh, next Monday at a Mix What I Like live. I don't think we have anything coming up before then. Uh, Definitely at the Remix Morning Show, 8 a.m. to 10 a.m. Eastern. Um, Yeah. So like Fred Hampton used to say, peace if you're willing to fight for it. Peace, everybody. Thanks again. Catch you next time right here 
on I Mix What I Like Live. I mix what I like, what I like, what I like, what I like, what I like. I mix what I like, what I like, what I like, what I like, what I like.